Like, I had my last class Wednesday. No, but I mean, like, for us. Like, it's like the 13th, and I think you have two days or something. Okay. Well, where you're lucky is we're going to have no time to learn anything between the, the next exam and the final. So. Okay. The final will be shorter. I mean, I don't see what we can do here. Okay. So, well done. Um, ooh. I wish someone had brought me a drink. Left it right there for me. Then I would have to trust that it was actually for me and that just left my last. Okay, um, so the exam is 5-6. Next week's recitation is review, which means Dr. Texel's class come to one of my recitations for review. Um, and then after that, there's only one recitation left. So there'll be one more paper, one more quiz the following week. And then we're kind of done, which is crazy. Um, okay, so, so far, yes. One, you dropped one. No matter what, you drop one recitation quiz. Yeah. Is the quiz that we get the exam? You mean the week that we have the final exam, or the next week? Um. Oh. You're right. <laughs> Did we like that? Should we yes. take the quiz? Yes. yes. Wow. Uh oh. There's a, should I do a poll? I think I could do polls on um, Blackboard. Maybe I'll do a poll. So I just got asked whether or not we're going to have in-class recitation or um, or if we're going to do it online again like last time so that you guys can, you know, not stress about doing recitation on an exam day. And it seemed like there were mixed reviews to that. How about if you don't have it at all? Yeah, I'll do a poll. I'll do a poll, and we'll see what happens. Which is a democratic process. Can it be both? Can like people show up to the normal recitation? Yeah, we'll take it online. Okay, so I'm gonna do a poll, and it's gonna be. So the thing with the doing it online thing is, some people didn't even do anything. Like, they didn't read the paper, they didn't take their quiz, they didn't do anything. And so they're not going to lose 10 points because it wasn't a physical recitation, but they then did lose the points for that quiz. So that's unfortunate, and I don't know if those people are like, please have it in class so I don't forget. So, I don't know, I'll do a poll. I'll see what happens. To be continued. Okay. This is what we've done so far. I'm going to read through all of it, but the most recent thing we spoke about um, was just the major concept of transcriptional regulation and post-transcriptional regulation. We talked a little bit about that. So post-transcriptional regulation means anything that happens after RNA is made, right? Because transcription makes RNA. Post-transcription, things that affect processing, things that affect stability of RNA, things that affect whether you're going to get translation, things that affect the function of the protein. Um, we spoke about regulatory regions, so these are DNA sequences um, that bind, are bound by activators and repressors and activate or repress transcription. These are also called sometimes enhancers. We also spoke about locus control regions, so this was an example with the globin genes and how the whole locus is regulated up as one. Um, we spoke about, we introduced the concept of Repressors and co-repressors and activators and co-activators and spoke about how they bind to DNA and um, gave some examples of common motifs, common DNA binding motifs in those proteins. And that's where we finished off the other day. Okay. So um, I did want to mention the concept of insulators. And so this is another DNA element. So we have these DNA elements that are these DNA sequences that bind to activators and repressors and regulate transcription. Then there's another kind of DNA element called, a, called an insulator. And it does exactly what 
it sounds like. It insulates that region so that you can kind of keep regulatory regions um, specific to certain genes. Because have you ever wondered how come if you've got these regulatory regions that are super far away from your transcriptional start site, how come they don't regulate some other gene? I know you guys have been sitting around wondering. Mm -hmm. All right, so these, so these kind of regions, they um, are involved in um, compartmentalizing a regulatory domain. So you might have gene A and gene B on the DNA like that, right? And so if you've got an enhancer that's smack in the middle, well, how do you know? And you know enhancers can be before or after a gene, right? They can be upstream or downstream from your transcriptional start site. Well, how do you know if this enhancer is for gene B or if this enhancer is for gene A, right? I know you guys have been thinking about that. So that's where these insulator elements come into play. And so they will kind of demarcate one kind of um, transcriptional, like some like, uh, what is it called? A, a regulatory domain. So um, you might have your insulator and then you'll have your enhancer. And by being able to see that you've got this insulator element here, you'll know that this enhancer is most likely involved in regulation of gene B and not gene A. And then sometimes you'll also have these barrier sequences. And those sequences, well, it's another kind of insulator and that's, that kind of controls the spread of heterochromatin. Again, remember, we just talked about how heterochromatin is spread by the activity of these readers and writers that are reading the methylation and recruiting writers that methylate, kind of spread it along the chromatin. And so there's also got to be a way to kind of regulate that that doesn't go further than it should go. And so that's another type of DNA sequence. Um, that controls that. So you've got insulator elements and you've got barrier sequences. And so, you know, you're sitting here taking notes and thinking, and I didn't do a quiz last weekend, so you didn't read about this yet. I'm so sorry. Um, but just kind of jot down insulator, barrier sequence, and then go look it up and read a little bit about it. So this could be useful if you're analyzing a genome again, because you've got all these sorts of sequences that, um, are well characterized and bind to different types of proteins. And so if you're analyzing a newly sequenced genome, you can start to think about, you'll know your transcription start site, you know what that looks like, you know what your promoter looks like. You can know what different types of enhancer regions look like. Um, and then you can also know what insulator elements look like. And you can start to kind of um, annotate, not really annotate, but annotate your genome that way so you can identify different units. Okay, so what did I say? Prevent enhancers and heterochromatin from running amok. I wrote that. Okay, so protein, so you've got to think if there's a DNA element, something needs to be binding to it, right? You're all the way back there today. We're on my world out of the whack. Okay. Um, Proteins are going to bind to anytime you have some kind of DNA sequence that's regulating something. So they'll bind to the insulators and um, directionally neutralize enhancers, meaning they're going to make sure that only that that enhancer only works in one direction and not in the other. Um, so this is just looking at chromatin, and the red is PI staining. What is PI staining? DNA. Yeah. Yeah. We talked about it when we were talking about analyzing S phase and um, analyzing doing analyzing cell cycle by flow cytometry by looking at DNA quantities. It's not limited, it's really just a DNA stain, right? And it's orange. And so then the green is BEAF, which is an in insulator protein that binds one of these insulator elements. And so you can see um, these are regions here that are, that are bound by this insulator protein. So you can stain those things and visualize them. Yes? Sorry. 
When you say that um, that those barrier and some of the readers um, prevent the DNA from running, I'm sorry. Yeah, prevent the DNA elements from running amok. So you said it prevents the enhancers and heterochromatin from running amok. Can you break that down for me? So do you mean that it's available and open for? So, so remember, so ask yourself, what is an enhancer, right? An enhancer is some kind of DNA sequence that a protein binds to that is going to help regulate transcription, right? And so if an enhancer is present smack between two genes, how do you know which gene is enhancing, right? Is it just nonspecific? No, these are very specific. Each gene is regulated, gene expression is regulated in a very specific manner, right? And so if there's an enhancer here, it must be for one gene or the other. It's likely not for both. And so this insulator element is present. This is another sequence that's going to kind of prevent um, this kind of non-specific activity of this enhancer to activate the wrong gene or, or repress the wrong gene. Okay, so that's what I mean by running them up. It's like out of control. Yes? Is it kind of like like a partition, it's a way to kind of, yes, it's a way to kind of partition, I don't want to call it a transcriptional unit, but maybe I will call it a transcriptional unit. Because if a transcriptional unit is all the DNA sequence that's bound by regulators, plus the coding sequence, plus the poly A signal, and, and any other um, five prime, three prime untranslated region, then you can say it kind of demarcates either side. Um, a way to localize, a way to kind of like segregate or compartmentalize each unit, each kind of regulatory unit. Yeah? Um, I'm trying to make sure that I Yeah, um, so the insulator here is like the case, so uh, protein that's bind on the number of it forces to the stop and make like Yeah, so anytime, exactly. So, so insulator, it's a sequence, but yeah, so protein actually binds to it to do its job. It's not just like that the sequence is there, there's actually a protein that binds. Um, same, with, same with the barrier sequence. Okay, and so this was the example of the insulator protein that binds to the insulator sequence and acts to insulate that enhancer or insulate that gene. Okay? Okay. Regulation of gene expression. Um, so we want to start looking for common themes, right? Um, so I'm going to give you some examples. Look for the common themes in terms of um, how gene expression is regulated. It's kind of all the same. Um, and see if you can kind of pull that out from these. Okay. So... In bacteria, you've got the concept of the operon, right? These are genes involved in one cellular function. So, for example, um, lactose metabolism, right? That's one cellular function that might require multiple genes. Um, and they're organized into an operon, and they're regulated at one, at one um, location. And you'll have your promoter. That's going to bind to RNA polymerase, and you'll have an operator that's going to bind to a repressor. So if a repressor is there, then your RNA polymerase can't bind, you can't get gene expression, and gene expression is repressed, right? So you'll have your, and, and if you get gene expression, that means RNA polymerase is binding, and you get transcription of all these different genes, and then you'll get an mRNA, which has coding reagents for all these different proteins that, and that's going to be translated, right? And you'll get these different enzymes. This is actually the trip operon, and they'll make one, two, three, four, five different enzymes that are required for tryptophan biosynthesis, okay? Um, so this is one example. This is an example you've seen before. We talked about the trip repressor and, and um, how that's regulated by the presence of tryptophan. So there's one example. Questions about this? Okay, great. Right. So when tryptophan is abundant, it can bind and activate the repressor, blocking transcription. So then you have your repressor binding to your operator, 
RNA polymerase can't bind, gene expressions off, right? Similar to the MET repressor. So you can look at the structure here of the tryptophan repressor. And the actual structure is going to change whether or not, depending on whether tryptophan is bound to it. So um, in the absence of tryptophan, the structure of the repressor is in such a way so that that helix term helix cannot bind in that major group of the DNA. But when tryptophan binds, it alters it. So this right here, this helix and this helix, and it's going to alter its orientation. And so it alters orientation, allowing those helices to bind right there in the major group. Okay? So in this case, this is just like the same example I've shown you a few times where the amino acid that's going to be made regulates whether or not the repressor can Okay. Questions about this? It's the second or third time I've shown it to you, so hopefully it's clear. But now is a great time to speak up if it doesn't make sense. Yes? So the repressors are specific for the area of the gene. Um, how is that possible? Or how does that work? The repressor is specific but for... The area of the DNA that is controlled the lines of the gene. Right. So, the repressor is specific for the operator. So let's go back to this here, right? So you've got your promoter, and there'll be this kind of binding site called the operator. That's specific right before the transcription will start tight. And then, yeah, it's a specific interaction because there's a sequence that binds specifically to that, that for in this case, that helix turn helix structure that we spoke about on Tuesday binds very specifically in the major groove of the DNA there. Okay? And so that's why the trip repressor represses the genes involved in tryptophan biosynthesis and not in methionine biosynthesis. That'll have its own MET repressor, which is going to have a different, slightly different structure that binds to a slightly different sequence and is going to specifically repress that gene. Or that opera. Make sense? Questions? Good. Okay. So, again, I'm going to bring up the concepts of negative and positive regulation. This confuses people. It really comes down to the fact negative regulation turns things off, positive regulation turns things on. Repressors block transcription, negative regulation. Activators activate transcription by promoting RNA polymerase activity, positive regulation. For whatever reason, this is always very confusing for students, so I'm just pointing it out that you might need to take a minute to think about it. And so here are just a few examples of negative and positive regulation right out of the textbook. Right, so you can have a repressor that binds and keeps um, and keeps transcription off. In both cases, your repressor is binding and keeping transcription off. It's just how that repressor is regulated that's going to determine whether it binds or not. But any time a repressor is binding and keeping transcription off, that's an example of negative regulation. In one case, addition of a ligand might remove the repressor. In another case, addition of a ligand to the repressor might allow for binding. But either way, if the repressor is binding to the operator and transcription is off, it's negative regulation. It's off. It's off. Yeah? So, would you say it's off because the repressor protein makes it difficult for RNA polymerase to bind? Right. can't bind, for instance? Exactly. The reason transcription is off is because the repressor is blocking the binding site for RNA polymerase. It cannot bind. It's as simple as that. Exactly. Positive regulation is when there's some kind of activator that's helping to recruit RNA polymerase and it's promoting gene expression. And there can be different ways that this happens, but either way, anytime you have an activator that's going to recruit RNA polymerase and gene expression is going to be on, that's going to be positive regulation. So, in this case, you could have um, 
a ligand that's going to bind to it and kick the activator off, or you can have a ligand that's going to bind that's going to um, allow for binding of your repressor, but either and that repressor activator. But either way, anytime an activator is bound and it can recruit RNA polymerase, you have transcription on. So this can be as complicated or as simple as you want to make it. But just remember, repressor bound, no transcription, negative regulation. Activator <coughs> bound, recruit RNA polymerase, gene expression, positive regulation. Okay? Questions about this? I think over the years I figured out how to break it down simply, hopefully. Okay, so repressors and activators can often have the same type of structure. This is because they both bind to DNA, right? They're both usually binding in that, um, in the major group of the DNA. And so they're going to have similar structures. These all these motifs that we went through on Tuesday. And they're often also regulated in some way by binding of some, some ligand that's going to change its conformation and either enhance DNA binding or inhibit DNA binding. It's the distance between their binding site and the promoter that determines whether they're an activator or a repressor. Right? If they're overlapping with the promoter and preventing RNA polymerase binding, what are they? Repressor. If they're um, recruiting RNA polymerase and allowing for it to bind, what are they? Right. You guys all got it. Right. Good. Um, so some gene regulatory proteins can act as repressors or activators depending on where they bind, what I just said. So um, bacteriophage lambda repressor is an example. So the only difference is, so you can have a repressor, it's called a repressor, but depending on where it binds determines whether or not it acts as an activator or a repressor. So in this case, you're recruiting RNA polymerase and you're actually activating transcription by the repressor. Um, but if it binds to a different region, where the operator is overlapping with the promoter, then it's going to prevent RNA polymerase from binding. So this is just reiterating what I said. And it was pre probably the reason it's called a repressor is because it was probably identified first as a repressor. Yes? No, I was thinking. So you're saying the repressor can allow activation? Yeah, so exactly. So I don't want you to come. So this is like a purposefully complicated one because it's called the lambda repressor, probably because historically it's probably identified as a repressor, but I don't want you to come get bogged down with so much as to what it's called as to more of where is it binding. So if it overlaps with the promoter and it prevents RNA polymerase from binding, then it's going to be acting as a repressor and keeping transcription off. Whereas if it is binding in a location where See here, you can see they have the operator next to the promoter, so it's not, it's not interfering, right? And it's actually recruiting. And in this case, you have your operator overlapping with your promoter, so it's actually interfering with the recruitment of RNA polymerase, and they're acting as a repressor. Okay? So I think of just keeping in your mind that concept of it has to do with the location, the proximity to the promoter. Okay, any questions? Okay. Yeah, sorry. Just a second. But okay, so if we're trying to figure out if it's activating or repressing, you want to act, ask first where it's located and then whether or not the DNA, I mean, uh, whether or not the polymerase is active or inactive. But the question is will polymerase be recruited or not? Okay. Yeah. And so if it's blocking the promoter, then RNA polymerase can't be recruited because RNA polymerase is recruited to the so that's when they overlap. Right. Okay. Okay. How many people we have here today? Like 20? Do you, do you believe there's something like close to 90 people in this class? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. register. Register. So. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Like, I've had one drop. Only one drop. <laughs> or withdraw. 
withdraw, which is what it's called. I rarely ever get people withdrawing. Just people stop coming because they know they can count on the lecture as being recorded. I know it looks like people are like freaking out and withdrawing left and right. Yeah. They're coming. A, they're all coming a recitation. They know they'll be in trouble if they don't. <laughs> and they said. Oh, right, and the exam, so like, notice, yes, all notice when the exams, on um, those exam days, there's nowhere to sit. Right? It's funny. Okay, so the lac operon is an example of gene expression regulated by an activator and a repressor, because there's kind of two criteria here. So who's learned the lac operon? I've asked this before. This is one of those things that was always so complicated to me, but then eventually it became very simple. But there's two things kind of being sensed here. One is the presence of glucose, because glucose is preferred. This bacteria, this is, this is an E. coli bacteria, would rather eat glucose than lactose. And so it doesn't want to make any of the genes required for lactose metabolism if glucose is because they'd rather use the glucose. And so then also, it's got to be sensing lactose presence because you don't want to make genes for lactose metabolism if there's no lactose, because that'd be silly too, wouldn't it? Yes? Well, we learned that it, it won't be like glucose better if it's not because it takes less energy to uh, make it break down. Okay, it likes glucose better because it takes less energy to break it down. There you go. I like that. When there's like, you can have a reason for things, it makes you remember them. Good. Okay. So, um, so in this case, so you'll have um, this cap, and cap is going to bind and activate expression of, um, activate expression of the black opera. And then you also have the lac repressor, which is going to, that's your, you've got your activator, you've got your repressor, which is um, your lac repressor. And so cap can only bind when there's no glucose present, because when there's no glucose present, cyclically AMP goes up. And so remember we talked about how you can have these ligands that will bind to activators and repressors and control whether or not they can bind to the DNA. Well, in this case, if cyclic AMP needs to bind in the absence of glucose to allow cap to bind to um, the cap binding site, which is an activator binding site. And so that only happens in the absence of glucose. And then the repressor only binds in the absence of lactose. So when lactose is present, it's going to bind to the repressor and release it. Okay. And so you can see here, only in the ideal situation where there's no glucose, right? So you've got cap bound, so your activator's present, it's bound, it can recruit on polymerase, and you've got lactose present, so your repressor's gone, do you actually get recruitment of RNA polymerase and express gene expression? So that's like your more complex, but very well characterized um, example of gene expression regulated by an activator and a repressor. Yeah? Why are the top and bottom not opposite? Why are the top and bottom not opposite? Okay, so right here, there is glucose. I'll go through them all and you tell me what you think. Okay. So here you have glucose, which means there's no cyclic AMP, because that's only produced in the absence of glucose. And so cap can't bind. So nothing's binding there. So there's no activator binding, you can't get recruitment of RNA polymerase. Okay? And you have lactose present. So it's binding to the repressor, and repressor can't bind. So even though you're not repressed, you also can't recruit. RNA polymerase because your activator is not there. Okay, so you get gene expression off. In this situation, there's no lactose, there is glucose, 
So in reality, why would you want to do lactose metabolism in the absence of lactose and when your favorite glucose is present? There's no activator able to bind, plus your repressor's bound. So you're repressed. And then in this one, there's neither glucose nor lactose. So even though you need something, there's nothing to metabolize. There's no lactose to metabolize. So why are you going to make your genes for lactose metabolism? And so you're going to have your repressor bound because there's no lactose to bind to the repressor to release it. And there's no glucose. So you have cyclic AMP. Your activator is recruited, but your, your repressor is still on the way. And then it's only in the ideal no glucose, yes lactose, that they all kind of work out together so that your cyclic AMP is bound to your cap, your activator, combined to that, active, that cap binding site. And there's no repressor bound because there is lactose, so it's able to bind to the repressor to release it. Okay? And then you have um, then that can recruit RNA polymerase and you get gene expression. So if you slow if you slow yourself down and kind of work your way through it, it kind of all makes sense. Yes. Okay, so would this be a negative effect if you were trying to synthesize for a um, but at the same time, you need lactose to bind to your repressor in order for gene expression to occur. Well, so negative. So the question was, is this negative feedback? Um, negative feedback is turning something off. So I see what you're saying. So positive feedback is turning something on. So that's when the presence of something that's made mm -hmm. turns something on. So I can see where you're going because there is some kind of feedback, kind of. What's really happening is you're sensing something. You're sensing lactose in the environment. So it's not actually feeding back, because usually when you talk about feedback, it's some gene that's being expressed that's turning and turning itself back on. But here lactose isn't being expressed, it's just present. But there is this kind of sensing going on where the lactose present is what's releasing your repressor, right? Allowing allowing RNA polymerase to actually bind because there's no repressor in the way. Yeah. Questions? I hear some conversation. No. Any other questions? I remember when I used to teach microbiology, I would teach this, and this always like kills anyone. But I don't know that I learned it very well until I taught microbiology. So you guys should all teach you should all teach microbiology so you can learn black opera really well. <laughs> or just teach it to each other. And then you'll really know it. So we did talk about, remember we did a paper in recitation where we where they use this, right? I see people going like this, which I thought was cent centromere, right? They were labeled uh, chromosome segregation and they were labeling the centromeres. And they actually engineered the lac repressor binding site. Remember that? right near the centromere, and then they had this lac repressor that was GFP tagged, and that was the way that they kind of followed the chromosomes. Maybe I should have taught this first. <laughs> they did. And that's just, that's, just, that's just using something that's known as experimental. It, that whole thing had nothing to do with the lac outcome. They were just using the fact that the repressor binds to um, the operator. Um, to label chromosomes. More people out there. Okay. Shall I move on? Okay, so that we're talking about gene regulatory proteins. So they combine DNA elements that are far from the promoter and interact through looping out of the DNA. And we talked about this in recitation with mediator. Um, also, this happens in bacteria also. And this is just where you... Um, you can think about it as there has to be a certain distance between your promoter and this enhancer region for that looping out to occur. If they're too close together, they can't actually loop out. So this is kind of an example, like, because you're limited by the flexibility of the DNA, right? So if you're only 100 base pairs apart, then you can't actually loop out. Whereas um, when you're much further apart, you can loop out. That's just kind of logical to think about. So there's a gene regulatory protein in bacteria. 
be. I don't think I'm going to put that little lullaby song. Um, <laughs> I just lied down on the floor. Let's see. Who, who saw, what is that? My own private eye, I don't know. Come on. What was it? Gus Van Sant. I was a film major for a short while. <laughs> I know, right? It's weird. It's weird. We all we all take different routes to get to where we end up. Um, anyways, this is a meeting where um, this guy has narcolepsy, so he's like every time he gets stressed out, he just falls asleep. <laughs> <laughs> the good, right? It's a nice protective mechanism. It's every time you stress out, you're just like. <laughs> good thing I don't have narcolepsy. I always joke that my husband does because he he sits down for two seconds. He's out. Yeah, when my son was born, they had to wake him up. <laughs> they did. Yeah. I remember the doctor was like, should we wake him up? I'm like, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> after twin, after twins, like you have one more. It's like, should we wake up dad? Um, anyways, uh, so there's in bacteria, there's this gene regulatory protein called NTRC, which activates transcription from a distance by looping out. Um, and directly activating RNA polymerase, exactly like this, loops out, direct um, activation of RNA polymerase, gene expression. And so there's actually um, um, data that they show in the book, in the text, right, at, right in the textbook, showing that looping out. So you can see your proteins bound, and then you've got that looping out and the interaction between this NTRC that's bound to the enhancer element interacting with RNA polymerase. That's like two weeks ago. Yeah. I can't remember yesterday. Huh? What is looping out? It's just literally that looping. So it's like there's this whole conversation we're having about how you can have these enhancer regions far, far from the promoter, yet they still activate gene expression or have an effect on gene expression. And so the way it happens is they kind of loop out and bend around, kind of like the when we talked about mediator, this also happens in bacteria. There's no mediator. But you'll have this kind of direct interaction between um, some, some gene regulatory protein and RNA polymerase that's encouraging activity of RNA polymerase. Yep. Um, this might be backtracking, but uh, do you remember um, last lecture we talked about, was it um, activators and repressions that, that combined with the side DNA? Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. So, when you have a picture like this, it could be from the side. Okay, so you're talking about, oh, we just spent a whole lecture on how these activators and repressors are binding basically in the major groove of DNA. That's what they're doing. That's what this is doing. This is just not showing, like, this is showing, like, the artist's interpretation, the very simple graphic designer drew a line. But if you look at the actual structure of the bound, you would see some sort of helix or beta strands or something kind of setting right there into uh, um, in that major group, usually. Yeah. So you can almost always assume with proteins that bind DNA, something's kind of sticking in to the major group and interacting with the um, bases that way. Yeah. And this qualifies for every answer. Um, no, um, it's hard to make a rule, like all enhancers would result in moving out, but um, this, I think, is a fairly common mechanism. Yeah. Yeah, and DNA is never opened up by enhancers or, or um, not enhancers, um, activators or pressures. That DNA double helix structure is really stable, and the only time it opens up is when you have like a helicase or something with some kind of helicase-like activity. And so here, you really just have proteins that are binding to the DNA, and their whole purpose is to recruit other things to the DNA. Okay? Yeah? Does not have a mediator because it doesn't have the general transcription factor? 
Does there is there no mediator mediator because there's no general transcription factors? Yeah, so this is in bacteria, so it's a much more simple system of just an activator recruiting um, RNA polymerase. Yeah, mediators. Yeah, so you can see already eukaryotic cells much more complicated, many more proteins. Yeah. So since we're bacteria, they don't need um, do we not need architectural binding for the, um, these kind of architectural proteins to help with the looping? Mm -hmm. uh, I'm guessing there's probably something that must stabilize the looping. This is a very simplistic drawing. Yeah, I'm not 100% sure. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, so back to the sigma factor. This is kind of where started, right? So there is different sigma factors that help to determine where RNA polymerase is going to be recruited to, right? So their um, bacteria are actually regulating their RNA polymerase activity through use of different sigma factors. And so it's just showing that there's these different sigma factors that regulate different genes. And so if you have one sigma factor, you're going to activate a certain subset of genes. For example, sigma 32 is going to activate genes induced by heat shock. So what can you say about DNA elements that are bound by sigma 32? Can you make any sort of generalization about them? Um, what can you say? So I'm telling you, sigma 32 recognizes promoters that, of genes that are induced by heat shock. Right, so these are genes that are kind of like stress response genes. So what can you say about the DNA elements that are bound by sigma 32? Did you have something? Well, I was going to say that they are temperature sensitive. Yeah, they are temperature sensitive, but what can you say about those DNA elements? Okay, you guys are going in the wrong direction, which means my question is bad. Um, <laughs> I'm telling from the answers that you guys are going, you guys are like over here, here in the outfield, and I'm like at home base. I don't know, actually, I don't know anything about baseball. So, so yeah. So, this gene is induced. Right, so these genes are all induced, and that means that, you know, when there's heat shock, then you get increased in the expression of sigma 32, and it's going to recruit RNA polymerase to a subset of promoters of genes that respond to heat shock. And I'm asking you, those promoters, those DNA sequences that are bound by sigma 32, if you can make some kind of generalized statement about them, what would you say? Yeah. Are they like conserved in a very, um, like, specifically, like they don't, they, um, they like, it's not like, you know, all these proteins can just bind sigma 32, but they have to be specific, and then at a certain time, that's when they'll. Okay, so you're getting there. What I'm trying to get you guys to say, you're very close, is that they all bind to the same sequence. So all those um, genes that are induced by heat shock have promoters with the same sequence because sigma 32 only binds to a certain sequence, right? Sigma 32 is a protein that binds to the DNA. It's and I'm trying to kind of get across to you that there's specificity when you're talking about regula regulation of gene expression. And there's a lot of regulation based on the activity of sigma factors. And so each of these sigma factors is going to bind to specific promoters, which, which regulates specific genes. So sigma 54 activates expression of genes involved in nitrogen metabolism. Let's say there's 10 genes. There's probably more than that. But let's just say there's 10 genes involved in nitrogen metabolism, well, you can guess that those promoters of those 10 genes have the same sequence in them because they're all going to be bound by sigma 54. Okay? Does that make sense? Great. So you can take that as far as looking at in eukaryotic cells and all this, all the genes that are induced by NF-kappa B are all going to probably have that same sequence near their promoter. Right? Because they're going to use NF-kappa B binding. Okay, so, C. 
sigma factors can be hijacked by viruses. Isn't that cool? So there's this SPO1, which is a virus that infects um, B. subtilis, and um, this virus uses the bacterial sigma factor to activate expression of its own sigma factor. And that activates transcription of viral genes at the appropriate time. Usually with viruses, you get expression of genes. Um, there's early genes, middle genes, late genes that are involved in different phases um, of, the, of the virus life cycle. And so it starts out with um, the bacterial sigma factor, and it gets hijacked and used on the viral genome to activate early genes. And then you'll get expression of another sigma factor, which is a viral sigma factor. And then it's going to activate expression of the middle genes, which is then going to result in expression of another sigma factor, which is then going to activate expression of the late genes. So, but it all starts by hijacking the bacteria's uh, sigma factor. So, after making these uh, virus uh, sigma factors, uh, do you care if the bacterial uh, sigma factors are gone, they're like, they're, they're probably replaced by virus sigma factors, like once they do their job, like once they get them to do their job, like make these like virus, and then so they move them off their water. So are you asking whether, so are you, so are you thinking of sigma factors as something that's all these guys are already covering? I'm just trying to gauge the angle that you're coming from. So you're asking whether what's happening when you have the job. So once the sigma factor and the RNA polymerase activate gene expression, what's gonna happen? That's what you're saying? Uh, I mean they okay, so viruses are using bacteria as sigma factors. Right. They make them do basically with their slate. Do yeah. their job, kick them out, right. and like they kick them out, and then start using their own sigma factor. Yeah. Yeah. So what happens is the 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 bacterial sigma factor binds to the, some some promoters on the viral genome. You get expression of some viral genes. One of those viral genes is going to be a different sigma factor that's for the middle gene. And then once that's present in high enough levels, it's going to replace that bacterial sigma factor and then you're gonna get expression of those middle genes, and that's gonna result in expression of another viral sigma factor, which once that's present at a high enough level, it's gonna bind to RNA polymerase and then activate expression of these late genes. Why would you need that with, with, so usually there's just, there's just a schedule as to when different genes are expressed in viruses because of how viruses work. They come in, they need to do certain things, and they need to do other things. So there might be genes that are associated with affecting the host. There might be genes associated with making more virus. Those are usually your late genes. But just taking virology. A few people. I would take virology, especially after this class. Yes? So that means the promoters are sequence-specific, but not species. The promoters are sequence specific, but not species specific. Um, you have to always be careful when you talk about viruses, because viruses are they like to um, acquire, they like they like to mutate a lot, and they like to evolve to utilize all sorts of host things. So they're more, and they tend to co-evolve with humans. Um, so um, you can't really think of them being, you know, it's like they're they quite some of these promoters are quite similar to human promoters for this reason and they've kind of evolved like if you think about it every virus that infects um, this bacteria right the ones that are very good at um, binding to the bacterial sigma factor like their genomes are very good they're gonna propagate better than the ones that are not right and so with each kind of round of replication of your virus you're gonna get kind of this evolution to have this very um, strong binding between the ba bacterial sigma factor and that viral promoter. Yeah, it might be a virology question. 
we can talk more later. Questions? I know I never mentioned fire before one time time for our own Questions? Okay. Okay. Um, so this is just kind of your picture that we've seen before of generic eukaryotic gene control where you've got your um, promoter, remember all your general transcription factors bind there, recruit RNA polymerase there, and then you can have gene regulatory proteins binding all over the place, either upstream or downstream um, from your promoter. And then, of course, it all communicates through mediator. Yeah? So, you, you know, like the blue chest piece? That, that, what yes. Would that, be? That, would be, that would be an enhancer or a mediator? Mediator is the big purple one that's kind of helping it all to communicate. Um, these, the blue chest piece, or any of these, are all gene regulatory proteins. And depending on how they're binding and what they're doing, they might activate or inhibit transcription. Oh, and in the region that they're binding to? Those are um, regulatory regions, or you, we call them enhancers usually when oh. they act, recruit activated. Yep. Can you explain what a mediator truly is? It's a complex of proteins that's going to bind to these regulatory proteins that are bound to the regulatory regions of the DNA and help with recruiting general transcription factors and RNA polymerase and activating or repressing transcription depending on what's happening, right? So if you're recruiting all the general transcription factors and RNA polymerase, you're going to be activating transcription. If you're inhibiting recruitment of RNA polymerase and all the general transcription factors, you're going to be repressing transcription. Good? Yeah. Right. So mediator is really so mediator is really helping with that communication between those distant elements and regulatory proteins and the promoter. That's really what mediator is doing. And so it just depends on whether or not RNA polymerase gets recruited or not, whether or not gene expression is going to happen. Okay? And so we're going to go a little bit more in depth. Here. Any other questions? Okay, so just quickly, let's talk a little bit, compare, contrast eukaryotic gene regulation versus bacterial gene regulation. Right, so you've got your general transcription factors versus your sigma factors, right? Um, there's no operons in eukaryotic, um, in eukaryotic genome that I know of. Um, there are a number of gene regulatory proteins per gene. So usually it's much more complicated the number of activators or repressors that are involved in regulating transcription in eukaryotic cells versus bacteria. Um, mediator is only in eukaryotic cells. And then, of course, the pathogen of DNA to chromatin is very specific. So that's another thing. Like, you've got all these different proteins that are involved in regulation. And eukaryotic cells, well, don't forget, like, a lot of them are recruiting these chromatin remodeling complexes and these modifying enzymes to kind of um, remodel the chromatin to uh, expose promoters for gene expression. That doesn't need to happen in bacteria. Okay, so this actually relates directly to the paper we did this week and last week in recitation, right? So we, we were looking at an activator in yeast, right? And we we're talking about GAL4, right? So this is an activator. So these, so eukaryotic activators are modular. They usually have a DNA binding domain, right? And so this is just the domain of GAL4 that binds to DNA. And then they usually have an activation domain, which is going to interact with general transcription factors and RNA polymerase. Um, and so that's kind of general. So what we did in this paper this week, they what did they do? They kind of cut, cut apart this activator 
and they kept the GAL4 binding do DNA binding domain, and then they put some viral um, activation domain for their purposes. And so this is frequently done in biotechnology and in, in, in um, just in the lab to do different types of research. So I'm going to give you an example um, uh, yeast, of the yeast two hybrid and how you're kind of using this GAL4 um, protein and Frankensteining it in order to analyze protein-protein interactions. And we'll talk about that in a minute. But this protein, this GAL4 protein, normally it binds to DNA and then it interacts with uh, general transcription factors, RNA polymerase, and then you get gene expression. That's how it works. If you change it and you cut off the DNA binding domain, is it going to activate gene expression? No, because it can't bind to um, the GAL4 binding site. But if you cut that out and you put in one that matches the one that they put, so they decided to make a chimera, which is GAL4 activation domain bound to, let's say, DNA binding domain. Well, then if you engineer in the sequence for binding to LexA, then you're going to get gene expression again. So you can actually use this a lot just in, in, um, in research. Okay? So what do I mean? So this is a yeast 2 hybrid. And so, again, it's the same thing where they use this concept of modular transcription activators to study protein-protein interactions. What they do is they take your DNA binding domain and the activation domain and they separate them. And then what they do is they bind them to different proteins. If those proteins interact, you should get gene expression. It's kind of cool, right? So it's, here's your DNA binding domain and they have it engineered to bind some kind of protein, whatever protein you're interest, interested in finding partners for. And then you have your activation domain bound to maybe the whole genome, so a whole cDNA library. And every time your protein X binds to your protein Y, you're going to get an activation of gene expression of some reporter gene. And so when you get activation of gene expression, then you knew that interaction happened. Actually, if you guys are interested in this, Dr. Schneider is doing this in her lab. Where are you? Matt. You guys should all go up there right now. <laughs> Go watch. I'm going to tell her you're all coming. Right, so if your proteins interact, then their fused DNA binding domain and activation domain will form a transcriptional activator that's functional. And you'll get activation of, of expression of a reporter gene. So this again, so your bait, so they talk about bait and prey. So your bait is like whatever protein you're looking for. So let's say I... Someone give me, what's your favorite protein? I hope that was in a room or something that's not funny. What, what, someone give me your favorite protein. G protein. G protein? Okay. So let's say, like, um, let's make it more specific. Let's say GPCR, G some viral GPCR, right? So viruses often include their own GPCRs, and there's a new virus, and we say, oh, this looks like a GPCR. What does it bind to? Okay? We want to know what it does. And so I might engineer a fusion protein where I've got my DNA binding domain bound to my GPCR. And then I want to know what in the whole genome does it bind to. So then I'll take a human, let's say it's a virus that infects humans. I'll take the whole cDNA library, so that's every single gene that's expressed in the whole human genome. And I'll clone each one separately to make a fusion between some human gene in the activation domain. And so then I put them in yeast, and I make the yeast so that the proteins can be in the same yeast cell together. And if they interact, because remember those genes are going to be expressed in the yeast, if they interact, then they're going to create a functional activator that's going to bind to the promoter, activate gene expression, and then I'll get some kind of color change in my yeast because my reporter is going to make my yeast turn blue. And so every single one, so, and then I know what I've pleated where. So all my cells that turn blue, I know my two proteins interact. And so then I'll say, oh, look, I know this GPCR from this new virus loves to bind to map kinase. Or I don't know. 
that never really happened for a bit. Let's just say, for fun. And so then I can start doing research and studying, well, what they talk to the cell, how does this virus affect the cell, and study some mechanism of how this virus signals. So I'm going to have you guys, we're going to end with a little think about, think about it yourself kind of um, with your friends question, okay? So you're studying the CMV, effect of cytomegalovirus, CMV, the effect on its immune response, on your immune response. So it appears that CMV is down-regulating some gene, gene X. You don't know what it is, but it's a super important gene that's vital for all things important in the world. Very important. The virus is down-regulating it, meaning decreasing its expression, and you want to know why and how this is happening. And you suspect that the CMV gene A is responsible, but no, have no idea what it's doing. So you decide to use a yeast 2 hybrid assay because you're like, well, if I can find out what gene A is binding to, maybe I can start to come up with a mechanism for how gene X is being down-regulated. And so you make your bait, which is CMV gene A, um, on the plasmid and yeast, which is going to be bound to the DNA binding domain. And then you make your prey, which is the whole human genome, all the cDNA in the, in the human genome, on individual plasmids, one gene per yeast. You're going to make the yeast grow on selective media, and you're going to look for your color gene that indicates, um, well, whatever. So I want you guys to talk about it and try to see if you can understand how this works. And tell me, if you get this color change, what does it mean? Okay, so take a minute, just think, discuss. I'll circulate to make sure people understand, and then we'll see what you think. Okay, so I think that I, I think I explained this in a way that confused people. 
because I just got an interesting answer that made me think, okay, I missed something. So the key here is you can't answer with this experiment exactly how genus is exactly. All you can do is find out what gene A binds to. Because when what you're doing is basically re, um, reconstructing a functional activator. And if you get that functional activator, then you're going to get expression of your gene and then your color change. And so by knowing which cDNA is in which yeast cell and which ones turn blue, you can say, oh, cDNA, you know, kinase A binds to gene A. Or cDNA ubiquitin ligase B binds to gene A. And then you end up with this list of candidate genes that are affected. And then you go and you validate and start to say, oh, okay, once you validate that they bind, you can start to look at the function and then look at effects on gene expression. Yes? You can tell which proteins interact. That's it. Because this kind of goes back to what you're really doing here is you've got your activator protein, but you've chopped it in half. And the only way it's going to come back together and get the part that binds the DNA and the part that interacts with the RNA polymerase is if the two proteins that you've engineered attached to them bind to each other. Any questions about this? I have one question, but over here we are saying CMB is non-regulated gene X. Yeah. That means if it works, we shouldn't have it grow. No, so gene X has nothing to do with this. Oh. Yeah, because your big question, your overall question is that CMB is not re regulating gene X. But you don't know why or how. But you suspect that gene A is involved and you have no idea what the mechanism is. And so the easiest way to start to figure out a mechanism is to say, well, what proteins does gene A bind to? Yes? So uh, who wants to answer? What does the color change mean? Yeah, it means there's an interaction. It means that gene A, which is your bait, is binding to one, one of your um, proteins from your CDNA. Because then that makes a functional activator. Okay, this is it for today. Have a good one, guys. Feel free to ask me about this further. We do have recitation on the right? We have recitation next week. It's review.